Hi everyone, I would like to talk today about macros and why they are used and uh, present an alternative for some of the use cases. So first let's start with why we need macros when programming. When programming we try to abstract around um, repetitive uses of code or parts of code that should be made parametric, so for which we want to um, substitute a certain value in several places around the code. And we can do this for things which we call first-class concepts, which can be stored in variables and passed around functions as arguments and this sort of stuff. For things which are not considered first-class concepts, we cannot use functions. That's kind of the definition of the first-class concept. And in languages for which we are lucky enough to have macros, uh, it means that we need to fall back to the use of macros. So let's see a few examples of these. Uh, the first one is environment manipulation. Um, so, for example, let's is the canonical construct to add something to the environment. We say that we want var to be equal to val when evaluating body. So it means that we could write let as a function which takes a variable name. Let's say we can quote it or uh, wrap it as a string or something like this. The value would be given as is, but the body cannot be evaluated at the call site and it needs to be evaluated by the let itself in an updated environment. So this cannot be done by a regular function and it cannot also be done with a lazy programming language, in which case the evaluation of the body would be delayed until it is requested by the let function, because even though the evaluation can be delayed, the environment wouldn't change in which the body would be um, evaluated. Uh, define struct is another example which uh, does not just taking a variable name like this, but does concatenation of the name and of the struct and the field name of the field um, in order to define accessor functions. Anaphoric if is a third kind which takes it um, and puts inside the so a variable named it and puts inside the result of evaluating the condition when it's just not not just a true or false boolean. Uh, in this case, it needs to inject this thing which is not present in the source syntax. Match is just an if, but which which has uh, several variables which it accesses. Um, another use case common for macros is changing the order of execution. This is not necessary in a um, lazy programming language. Um, for example, if can be written in a lazy programming language with something something like this. So we're going to wrap the arguments with um, thunks and we're going to force the results of choosing one of the two thunks. Match works the same way, except that in the case the pattern actually binds some variables like this, um, then we need also to extend the environment in order to evaluate the if cons part. For loops, uh, we have the same thing. We can wrap the body in a thunk, but in this case, and in the case of many loops which loop over lists or collections, we need to also extend the environment with a new binding. So we're back to the need to manipulate the environment. Um, and the last three uh, common use cases are syntactic sugar, so infix syntax, uh, decorative keywords like the equals or the in, which would be necessary in a programming language which uses a more complex parser, but in Racket we just rely on the S expression parser, so these are mostly decorative. And um, the, these uh, keywords can appear in multiple places, and we'd like this in and the in for for list slash list to be textually the same, but different concepts that we can rename, for example, this uh, or that one. Um, and so when we are importing a construct like let or for slash list, we'd be able to rename these independently. And uh, also, for example, t extracting things from identifiers. So these are all things which are yeah syntactic sugar. Um, and the last two um, cases are optimizations, things that we want to evaluate at compile time. 
and code analysis. So anything like type brackets or turn style, which will propagate some um, information types, uh, etc. Many macros need to pay attention to source locations, but also to tooltips that they uh, will want to make available to the ID or in the case of source locations for error messages. Source locations are a bit of a bummer um, for writing macros because you need to pay attention to assign the proper source location otherwise the user code will have errors which end up in the wrong place and uh, this can make debugging more difficult for the user. Another um, slightly problematic thing with macros is if we take the source for the document that I'm currently um, scrolling through and start the macro stepper, it will give us a window like this. And let's say that this E identifier should actually be the same one as this, so that this should refer to that and not to this one. It's impossible in this case, but let's assume that this is the bug that we have because we wrote an unhygienic macro and this E should be referencing something that the user wrote. Uh, we're gonna have to debug some thing which are, well, the scopes attached to this piece of syntax. And these scopes, one of them will be wrong or extra nervous or missing and will mean that we won't be able to make this reference to that one. And we're going to have to basically just uh, watch the two and find out which of the scopes is wrong and uh, then find out which part of the code introduced it or did not introduce it or something like this. And that's quite a difficult um, way to debug, I mean to, yeah, quite a difficult thing to debug when writing unhygienic macros. And um, the tooling that we have is not quite good enough for it to be um, a pleasant experience to debug. So, yeah, macros are useful tools, but they do have a few drawbacks. These are just two small examples. Uh, and it's interesting to just consider alternative options. So what I propose is that we um, use a programming language <coughs> with um, first class environments. So first class environments means that the environment is not just something that is handled by the programming language itself, but it is something that is uh, passed around explicitly um, by the code and can be explicitly manipulated. You have this a bit in JavaScript, for example, where you can access the arguments of a function with a special variable slash keyword named arguments. Um, you also can access all the global variables in JavaScript by accessing them. They are just properties of the window object. So you can do just window dot any global variable or window brackets the name of a global variable and you can access them. Uh, JavaScript, however, do, does not offer access to local variables and there's nothing that really allows you to uh, add or remove bindings uh, easily. You do have something like this in Python, but it's mostly unsupported slash don't do this kind of um, deprecated or not recommended usage. So let's have a look at our language. Function calls become like this, become sugar for an primitive application, which we'll note at with this sign, of a function to which we specify an environment and the arguments are lazy, so they're just thunks. This is a primitive lambda, which um, take an environment as an argument and return the argument after evaluating it in this environment. And variable accesses like this are just syntactic sugar for accessing the variable name, so Imagine that this is quoted or hash ref is a macro, for example. Uh, so we're going to access this in the environment. And it means that if arg here is some variable x, it will only be resolved after the caller f actually supplies an environment in which to evaluate the argument. So uh, with this, we can explore some first class solutions for the problems that we had previously. Um, so, for example, we can define let using first class environments as a function. So let as a function is just a lambda function, which takes an outer environment, so the environment at the place where the um, um, so the environment at the place where the let was called. So in this case, it would be let with some arguments, and it would be translated down to 
uh, core which passes the local current environment which is available here um, and by the way yeah uh, env is basically the only variable which exists in this um, programming language all the rest is um, just a bit of sugar but basically yeah all the other variables are stored as uh, elements of this special env keyword slash variable and so yeah our let function will be a lambda function which takes the outer environment the variable name the value and the body so we're going to extract the name from the variable name. Uh, since it was a promise, we have actually promises that behave a bit like syntax objects. So this is like syntax e um, in order to unwrap the promise and look inside. And we're going to convert the result to a string to get the variable name. Um, we're going to force the promise for the value in the outer environment unmodified. And we're going to set this into the end, I mean, into a clone of the outer environment. Um, so we set variable equals value in a clone of the entire environment, and um, we will therefore obtain an environment that is suitable to evaluate body. So we can then force the body in that environment. Um, we could also define let with a um, order of a different order of arguments. So this is just let x equals 1 to 3 in x plus 1, but just written differently. Um, and we can actually call our let function, which was defined just above here. Um, so we can call it uh, specifying, giving it the outer environment, variable, value, and body, and just checking that the where and equals um, keywords are the appropriate ones. For control flow, it's just what you would expect in a lazy programming language. So we just force um, the uh, results of picking one of the two uh, branches depending on the condition and we force the condition straight away before evaluating anything else. Um, um, for syntactic sugar, we'll consider identifiers with uh, different meanings, which I sh had shown an example with a let in versus a for slash list in. Um, and so what we do in order to do this is that we want to have uh, some polysemic identifier. So there's already a, racket in library, a racket library, which I wrote a while ago, which does this. And basically the semantics are roughly that when you are accessing a variable in the environment, um, it gives you a hash table in which you want to access uh, the variable key for by default for variables but in this case this is not just a variable it's a keyword for the let construct so we are going actually going to um, so get the um, the this uh, by identifier we're gonna access it from the environment hash with of the keyword which we're interested in and then in that we're not going to access the variable uh, part of this identifier but we're going to access the let in keyword part and same thing for the key keyword in uh, and then we can just check that they are equal to a predefined constant that would be declared somewhere else which means that uh, for the difference with the let in and the for slash in is that uh, in this case we are accessing the same keywords in the environment here and here, but um, we access also the sub parts of this binding in the, the environment and we access a different sub part here. So we are going to access the let in keyword part here and the for keyword part, which means that these sub parts of the identifier are independent and can be renamed or attached in a way attached to other ident identifiers independently. Um, Another interesting piece of syntactic sugar is when we want to have extra parentheses, like here in a let, so I didn't put the double wrapping of parentheses, but this is just a starting example. Uh, in order to achieve this, we since this is just a promise which is given to the let and expects an environment, in that environment, when we are going to evaluate that promise, we will override the hash percent app, which is invisible here, implicit, uh, which means that we are just going to force 
the binding, this, uh, in an environment in which we have set hash percent app to cons, for example. Um, and if we wanted to actually allow um, the expression here on the right to contain its own proper applications, um, we could just here supply something which is a bit more clever than cons and resets the hash percent app to the original one when evaluating the right hand side of the let. Um, infix syntax needs external support in the language or overloading of the implicit hash percent app here. Um, I have a work in progress prototype for this in which uses mixfix. Uh, so mixfix is a um, sort of algorithm for defining families of parsers which can be extended with custom operators and these operators are given a relative precedence which means that it makes for quite a um, composable way of declaring identifiers um, I mean about, uh, operators because it means that one library for example which declares uh, plus and minus can talk about uh, this operator and these operators, but it does not need to talk about if then else and this library which declares if then else does not need to talk about plus and minus. So it means that you can declare these um, identifiers in different libraries without having problems of setting an operator precedence which might be a bit arbitrary and relate operators which have nothing to do with each other. So in this case if one wants to mix directly a plus or minus with an if then else directly, we would actually need to go through an extra pair of parentheses, and this is generally what you would want um, in a programming language, which um, is not based like bracket on just S expressions. So um, the last couple of um, things that we had to consider are uh, to manipulate identifiers, for example here we want to extract the dot colon in parts and the, the x part. Uh, since this is just a promise which can be inspected to see what's inside, we just do promise slash string, uh, prom promise to string, sorry, and then we can, um, yeah, like check if it ends with int or stuff like this. So it means that things can be inspected and then torn apart and uh, recombined as appropriately ne needed. Um, compile time transformations are an important use case for macros. It allows us to perform things in a more efficient way because we want to evaluate some uh, things at compile time and leave the rest for runtime, but do some pre-processing yeah, ahead of time. Um, so what I would propose in this case is to have a sort of quoting slash quasi quoting, uh, I mean quasi quoting slash unquoting mechanism, where basically the entire expression is pretty much quasi quoted in a runtime uh, wrapper and compile time escapes from that wrapper, so just like you would do here. And it allows us to have this expression be run at compile time. It will have access only to the identifiers which are properly, um, well, which have already been evaluated at compile time. Um, and uh, this allows us to force the evaluation of this part while leaving the rest pending and to be evaluated at runtime later on. Um, so just as a conclusion for this part, it's that um, optimizations are basically semantics preserving transformations of the program and it means that removing the compile time and runtime markers should leave an ex equivalent program. Um, finally, so for code analysis for which uh, type brackets and turn style are very good examples of performing analysis on the program at compile time, um, one of the very interesting features of uh, first class environments is that they can be type checked. So this is an example which has nothing to do with first class environments, but it's, uh, it's an example of how row types work. So row types are um, type variables, basically, which can be substituted by anything, but they expand to multiple bindings in a struct construct. Um, or a re um, oh, sorry, not record, um, a variant construct. So, for example, this 
says that x should be a struct which takes a field named foo, a field named bar, and the rest, and it will return a struct with a field named foo, a field named crux, and the rest. And uh, what we'll do here, for example, is that we're going to do x without dot bar because we want to remove this, and with dot crux it equals to um, something, and what we'll do is convert, for example, bar from a string to an int, because that is the conversion we wanted to do, and use the dot foo field in some ways to justify that it's being used. Um, so this is just a simple example of manipulation of uh, a data structure, and this is something that can be typed uh, type checked using row types, which will provide the necessary abstraction here. So the resulting x will I mean, the resulting uh, struct will contain all the original fields of x without the dot bar and with an extra dot crux field. Um, manipulations of the environment are pretty much exactly the same thing. We're going to remove some bindings, rarely, and mostly do so in order to shadow, so remove and re add the same binding. Um, and we're going to introduce some new bindings when we have a let or something like this. Um, and it means that these these manipulations of the environment can be represented as uh, row types in a type system. So this is not something that would be used within, I mean, described within functions or macro-like facilities within the language itself. It's support which is external to the, the program, uh, so support directly by the language, but it's good to have a type theory which can express manipulations to the environment, because um, macros are something which are quite difficult to type check. The macro itself, not the result of the macro application, but the macro itself, and this gives us a solution to type check things which for which we would normally use macros for. If we wanted to have this implemented within the language, uh, it's something that should be explored still. I think that with the overloading of hash percent app and the laziness, it's quite possible to build some fairly complex analysis of code, but I haven't actually explored this yet. And uh, lastly, well, this is just a small example which uh, uses the uh, bind the, the sorry constructions which we previously described, and all these are just defined as functions starting from a minimal environment which just has uh, lambda let and a few things like this. I mean a basic let, but we can redefine our own let or with a different syntax or this sort of things. So yeah, that's uh, the. Um, proposal that I'm studying for having an alternative to macros by using uh, first-class environments which allow us to access from the definition of a function the variables which are supplied as arguments even if they are not bound and um, extend the environment in which the rest of I mean in which other arguments are evaluated so that we can add and modify bindings like this so um, I think we can go on to questions if there are any. Thanks.